This is CBC Vancouver News. And today we are creating a new story in our history here. A historic agreement has been reached between the B.C. government and the Haida Nation, affirming the First Nations title over the islands of Haida Gwaii. And... Brother died playing PlayStation in his bedroom. Uh, he, he went to work that day, he went home, he did drugs, and he, and he died. Drive to destigmatize. A car rally is held to mark eight years since BC declared the toxic drug crisis a public health emergency. Why one Richmond family says more needs to be done. Plus... The, the responsibility for her safety are, are, um, are with me, I think. Concern is growing over the health of a two-year-old orca trapped in a remote lagoon on Vancouver Island. But rescuers say they remain optimistic. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Janella Hamilton. We begin in Haida Gwaii, where a historic land agreement has been reached between the BC government and the Haida Nation. It's been decades in the making. As Betsy Trumpner reports, the agreement recognizes the First Nation's inherent right to the land and affirms its title over the islands of Haida Gwaii. We've all witnessed history here today. Hold them up high. On a table strewn with cedar boughs, Haida leaders and government officials sign a groundbreaking land agreement called Rising Tide. Tamara Davidson of the Haida Nation. This does not mean that the government is granting us anything. We have always held our inherent rights and title to our lands. We were born knowing this is ours. Gogwees, Haida Nation President Jason Alsap calls it a historic day. So in our long and ancient history here on Haida Gwaii, this, this chapter with British Columbia, you know, which has been a dark chapter in many ways, it's really an extremely, it's been a, you know, damaging to the land and in, you know, harmful in many ways, but it's really a short time. It's a very short part of our ancient history here with Haida Gwaii. And today we are creating a new story in our history here. The first of its kind deal shifts ownership jurisdiction of land from the Crown to the Haida Nation in Crown law. The Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation says how the title will be implemented is yet to be determined. When we introduce this new law in the Legislative Assembly, it will be the first time in Canada the title is recognized in this way. It, it, it is an entirely different way of recognizing title, something that the courts have been telling us to do for a long time. And in that sense, uh, this agreement won't only raise all boats here in Haida Gwaii, uh, increase opportunity, prosperity for the Haida people and for the whole community and for the whole province, but it will also be an example and another way for nations, not just in British Columbia, but right across Canada. BC Premier David Eby gives a woven wolf blanket to Gogwees and says this will be one of the greatest highlights of his life. When I reflect on my life, uh, this will without doubt be one of the great highlights. BC says this agreement will not impact anyone's private property on Haida Gwaii or change the powers of local government. Betsy Trumpener, CBC News, Prince George. It's been eight years to the day since BC declared a public health emergency after toxic drug deaths reached unprecedented levels. To mark the somber anniversary, one Richmond family impacted by the crisis organized a car rally aimed at destigmatizing drug use and addiction. As Michelle Gomez reports, the family is pushing for better access to safe supply to help prevent more drug users from dying alone. About a dozen cars paraded the streets of Richmond today, decorated in purple. It's the colour representing overdose prevention. Drug users um, don't always 
look like the vision people have of them. Uh, my son was a businessman. He had a job. Um, he struggled with mental illness and, and addiction. Debbie Tablotny says her son Curtis died of a toxic drug overdose in 2022. My brother died playing PlayStation in his bedroom. Uh, he, he went to work that day, he went home, he did drugs, and he, and he died. Curtis's family organized the car rally to bring awareness to the stigma that drug users face and to advocate for more government support, including mental health resources and safe supply. We didn't know where most of the services were. I would sit on the internet and research and research and I could not find ways to help him. And when I did, he was turned down. In February, Richmond City Council resolved to ask health authorities to look into the possibility of a supervised drug consumption site at the city's hospital. But after hundreds protested the proposal at City Hall, the city announced it would not move forward. It's a tragedy in our community. It's not just the people who are passing away, it's the family and friends and co-workers, their neighbours. In the last eight years, more than 14,000 British Columbians have lost their lives to illicit toxic drugs. And the deaths escalated in 2023, with an average of almost seven deaths per day, up from 6.2 per day in 2022. It's the leading cause of death for people between the ages of 10 and 59. The reason we're here is because people are hiding in their bedrooms and you don't know how many people are actually using and who's gonna die tomorrow. You know, it's seven people in BC, it's seven. The Tablotny family rode in Curtis's old car today, which they have since refurbished. My son always says, my oldest son, he loves driving it because that's his voice. The car motor is his voice and he revs the engine and said, this is my brother's voice. Be nice to each other. Michelle Gomez, CBC News, Richmond. Years later, the toxic drug crisis continues to claim the lives of British Columbians. Today, a town hall was held to mark the eighth anniversary of the declaration of the public health emergency. We've not been giving people enough choices. You give people one choice, and uh, this is why we're seeing diversion on the street. The goal of the public meeting was to provide a safe space for downtown Eastside community members to grieve collectively and discuss how to build a way forward. The Vancouver area of network users says the toxic drug crisis continues to impact communities across the province. There are 200,000 people in this province who use illicit substances. We need a regulated supply and we need it now. People are dying and it's not acceptable. Graham says what's needed are regulations for drugs similar to those for alcohol. In a statement released today, Premier David Eby says the toxic drug crisis has had a catastrophic impact on families and communities, adding there is much more to do. The province has selected a preferred bidder to build the stations for the Surrey Langley Skytrain extension, and it includes a company being sued by Metro Vancouver for hundreds of millions of dollars. The preferred bidder is a group of companies including Axiona Infrastructure Canada. This company and Metro Vancouver are in court over issues relating to the North Shore wastewater treatment plant, accusing each other of major failures, which has led to the project being billions over budget and years behind schedule. In a statement to CBC News, the Ministry of Transportation says the province follows best practices in procurement supported by Infrastructure BC to ensure stringent competitive selection processes that drive the best value for the people of BC, adding we undertook a robust due diligence process to select proponents best to meet the requirements of this project. The, the Surrey Langley Skytrain project is a 16 kilometer extension of the Expo line from King George Station to Langley City Centre. Once completed, it will be the first rapid transit expansion south of the Fraser River in the last three decades. A Chilliwack School Board trustee says she's relieved to have won her defamation case against former trustee Barry Newfeld after he called her a striptease artist. 
it just felt so ridiculous that that someone could completely repurpose my work and create a new identity for me. Um, it just just seems so awful. It seems so wrong. And and yet it seemed like there was nothing I could do. So yeah, the relief is is just palpable. Bondar has had an active social media presence that she says is focused on science education. She has appeared in a few educational videos that she characterizes as sex positive. The comments in question came during the campaigning period for the 2022 school board elections when Newfeld referred to Bondar as a striptease artist during a video interview. The ruling orders Newfeld to pay Bondar a total of $45,000 for defaming her. CBC News reached out to Newfeld and his lawyer for an interview, but have yet to receive a response. BC communities are stretching provincial dollars to guard against climate-related emergencies. Since 2017, cities, towns and villages in the province have been busy applying for and spending money under a provincial fund meant to shore up dikes, stabilize slopes and plant trees. But as Chad Possum reports, there is concern the fund may not be keeping up with growing demand. Here in Vancouver, along the banks of the Fraser River, money from a provincial fund put to good use to protect against flooding. It's one of thousands of pro projects from the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. Advocates say it's a beacon of hope for municipalities. There is definitely more demand. Uh, and since the fund was started in 2017, actually, we have approved 1,868 projects. Against the threat of wildfires and flooding, most municipalities do not have the tax base to pay for major infrastructure changes, so they have to turn to things like the fund. In its first year, 241 people applied to the fund. Last year, it was double that amount. The Union of BC Municipalities say towns and municipalities are desperate for help, but the fund may not be keeping up with demand. But whether we are getting what we are asking for is another question. Um, because as you know, climate change is one of the biggest issues that we are facing. So the, the, the plans required by the province um, have become more complex. So they're asking more of us. And yet when we ask for more funding, we are not getting it. Now, the fund is increasingly paying for more complex projects with the most expensive ones coming in the last year. Things like flood mitigation, erosion projects, dike upgrades, even air conditioners for social housing in Vancouver. The province says it's committed to keep growing the fund and has increased funding for it dramatically over the past six years. Now, so far this year, flooding risk in BC has been minimal, but it is expected to be another bad season for wildfires, meaning cities and towns will be looking for help with that and have few options to rely on other than provincial funding. Chad Pawson, CBC News, Vancouver. To Nanaimo now, where an alarming rate of pedestrian deaths is prompting calls from advocacy groups to make streets safer. As Claire Palmer tells us, they want road infrastructure to be focused on people rather than vehicles. It's intersections like this that have pedestrians on their heels in Nanaimo. There have been three pedestrian fatalities in the Nanaimo area in recent months. You know what, honestly, we only walk in our neighborhood. I mean, the street we live on does not have sidewalks. <laughs> That's true, but and we just do a lot of kind of no dog. You can't walk in the middle of the road because cars that come is true. kind of fast. There's a lot of corners. That's Nobody true. is very good at driving slow. Strong Towns advocates for a new approach to urban planning and development. They believe more can be done from an infrastructure perspective, especially at intersections like this one here at Uplands and Departure Bay. Now, I don't feel that comfortable on this uh, gravel gutter here, uh, but if I were a couple feet over there onto an actual sidewalk, I'd feel much better. Nanaimo lacks a lot of pedestrian infrastructure. Um, most of Nanaimo doesn't have sidewalks, for example. Um, however, there are lots of roads that are, especially in the north end, overbuilt, uh, leading to drivers driving a lot faster and decreasing safety overall for pedestrians, anyone outside of a vehicle. In places like this, like, we got a sidewalk, but the roads are so wide that the cars are moving so fast that it's like, okay, I need to have my head on a swivel at all times. 
The city of Nanaimo knows there are problems with infrastructure as a result of the amalgamation of several communities in the 70s and say they're always looking to build back better to address these problems. Those were all developed and created under uh, different standards, um, really more rural standards than we would expect to see in a, in a current city. And so what that's left us with is a lot of gaps in our walking and biking infrastructure. Uh, and so yeah, it, it's an ongoing process to fill in these gaps. The city has been adjusting roads to be narrower, adding speed bumps or traffic circles when it's updating other public works. One such updated road, Metro Drive, even won an award for the changes the city implemented. But for strong towns, more needs to be done at a higher level. And at the provincial level, we really, really need to increase the amount of budget that the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure is sending towards projects that get people out of cars. For now, the group recommends pedestrians and motorists slow down and watch out to prevent further fatalities. Claire Palmer, CBC News, Nanaimo. Plans to rescue a stranded orca calf off northern Vancouver Island continued tonight after the first attempt was called off on Friday. The CBC's Lindsay Duncombe got an inside look at the efforts being made to get the young whale back to open ocean. Every day the concern grows. Simon John, chief of the Ahadisat First Nation, is checking on the health of the two-year-old orca Quisaheus, or brave little hunter, trapped in this lagoon for three weeks now. It doesn't take long to spot her. A lot of the responsibility for her safety are, are, um, are with me, I think. How come? mainly because I'm the leader of our people. The whale has been trapped since her pregnant mother was beached and died on a sandbar. The youngster seems to be doing okay. Her swimming and diving look healthy. Where we are right now, the water is 39 meters deep. It's the deepest part of the lagoon. The people who are studying Quisaheus' behavior say she likely likes to be in the deepest part of the water because it's salty and more comfortable. The plan is still to lift her out of the lagoon in a sling, load her onto a truck, and get her to open water where she will hopefully reunite with her pod. Next time, rescuers plan to use different nets and bigger boats. If she knew we were helping, it would be a lot easier, but uh, that's not the case. And uh, having said that, we are, we're very optimistic that we'll, we'll be successful. It's all informed by LIDAR, laser-generated maps detailing the bottom of the lagoon. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans is seeking advice from people who trapped whales for captivity decades ago. In nearby Zabelos, population about 100, people are cheering for the whale. If she was to make it out, that would be a big yahoo. And I think that there would be a lot of happy people. As for when the next rescue attempt will happen, it's complicated. There are several different variables at play, including the weather. Another attempt could likely happen in the next few days. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, on the Ahadisat First Nation. After yesterday's strike, Iran says now, cons now considers it the matter concluded. But the signal from Israel's leadership is that this isn't over. Details after the break. Stay with us.
The world woke up today facing the threat of a new conflict. After last night's strikes against Israel by Iran, Tehran says it views the immediate dispute as closed. But there's a different message from Israel. The CBC's Margaret Evans reports. The long shadow war between Iran and Israel making itself known in the night skies above the Middle East. An unprecedented Iranian attack ultimately thwarted by Israel's air defense systems and its allies. The Israeli military claims nearly 99% of Iran's missiles were intercepted. It released these images of what it says is an F-35 returning to a targeted airbase, presumably to show what damage there was has been minimal. The question remains whether escalation is inevitable. Iran described the attack as self-defense after a suspected Israeli strike on its consulate in Damascus on April 1st, killing top commanders. Some Iranians celebrated the attack on Israel in Tehran, but military officials have signaled they're hoping to now draw a line under it. There's no intention to continue this operation, says Iran's armed forces chief Mohammed Bagheri. But if the Zionist regime takes any action against the Islamic Republic of Iran, our next operation will be much bigger. Israel promised a response even before its war cabinet had met. Benny Gantz is one of its members. We will build a regional coalition and exact a price from Iran in the timing and fashion of our choice, he said. U.S. President Joe Biden urged restraint in a call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, saying Washington won't take part in any retaliatory attacks against Iran. That is a clear line aimed at Netanyahu. And if he were to decide to take that sort of retaliatory action, he is risking what is evidently Israel's most important strategic asset, which is this relationship with the United States. I think it would be dangerous to do so. It remains unclear how these developments will impact the war in Gaza, overshadowed by this latest crisis and the new sense of peril it brings with it. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Here we have a live shot of Burrard Inlet facing the North Shore. We'll be right back after the break.
news. Check it out at gem.cbc.ca and never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox and keep connected with us. So I know when I really like a song, if within the first three seconds, I'm already vibing to it. Hey, I'm Rohith Joseph. Vibin' is the new show all about discovering great new songs and fresh artists from across BC and beyond. It's not one person dictating what good music is, it's the community sharing what good music is. Stream Vibin' on CBC Listen. And that was a golden goal for Canada, beating the U.S. at the Women's World Hockey Championship. Redemption after losing the same game last year to the Americans on Canadian soil. Today's win marks Canada's 13th gold, a tournament record. That is your late news for this Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us. For news at any hour, you can always head to our website at cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is on the early edition on CBC Radio 1. That starts tomorrow morning at 5.30. Have a great night.